From WRAL News, this is Focal Point. A drunk driver crosses the line. It was a very severe impact. And a family is torn apart. He took away someone's child. He took away someone's right to be a grandparent. He took away a wife's and mother's life, her right to be a mother. He was an illegal immigrant with five previous drunk driving arrests. How could something like this happen here to us? Statistics reveal an unusually high rate of drunk driving arrests and crashes involving Hispanic immigrants in our state. It just is emotionally so difficult when you talk to a family and meet with a family who has lost somebody and they're saying, why? And I don't have an answer. Some blame cultural differences and a lack of understanding of both our laws and the consequences of drunk driving. We should be at the point where everybody knows, even the first time, that you don't drink and drive. But they don't. Punishing those who don't can be a challenge if they're undocumented. If they are able to post whatever kind of bond they get, odds are we probably won't see them again. There are efforts underway to educate Hispanic immigrants on the dangers of drunk driving. Any time a Latino gets arrested for DWI, it hurts me, personally. Uh, it hurts all the other Latinos. Uh, it's making us all look bad. But many families are paying a far higher price. How does somebody feel, you know, a daughter <laughs> laying up there like she? Drunk driving crosses many lines, legally, morally, and socially. It crosses racial and cultural lines, too. Most of the people arrested for drunk driving in our state are white males. But a closer look at the numbers shows an unusually high rate of drunk driving arrests and crashes among Hispanic immigrants. Our focal point, why so many people who cross the border into our country cross the line behind the wheel. Emily Moose says the wind chimes hanging in the elm tree over her son's grave make music whenever she's there. Here she feels his presence, but most of the time she feels his absence. Some days I feel like um, that there's a big space, a big hole. Uh, inside of me that I can't feel. A hole left by the death of Scott Gardner. He was the center of our family. Scott met Tina Jackson at a party when they were in college. I remember him telling me that um, she completed him and she was meant to be his wife. You could just see it, you know, the glow in Tina's eye and the glow in Scott's eye. They, 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 were, uh, they were meant for each other. They were meant for each other. Scott and Tina married in 1997. They later had a son, Jackson, and a daughter, Avery. Scott was a very caring person. He loved being a father. Very dedicated to his family. Um, you know, his faith was very important to him. He, um, you know, he was a role model to me. I looked up to him and I enjoyed our time together. Scott became a teacher and baseball coach at the Highland School of Technology in Gastonia. I never met anyone that didn't like Scott Gardner. We all look up to certain people, and, and a lot of people looked up to Scott. Tina stayed home to raise their children. She's just a very easygoing, charismatic person that you wanted to be around. In her spare time, Tina trained for marathons. When Tina set her mind that she wanted to do this or she wanted something to happen, it happened. In the summer of 2005, Scott and Tina Gardner decided to take a long-awaited vacation to Sunset Beach. They rented a house with their friends, Brian and Tiffany Pate. This was their first family vacation as a whole family that they had had since they'd been married. On July 16, 2005, shortly after 5 p.m., the gardeners were heading east on Highway 130 in Brunswick County. They were just a half hour away from the beach. The pates were right behind them. About a mile down the road, Ramiro Gallegas pulled out of a small store in his pickup truck with three passengers. He was driving erratically as he was traveling west on 130. He, uh, he ran off the road to the right, right down there where the asphalt and that driveway is. 
jerked it back onto the road, and that was when he started losing control and coming sideways. At the last second, Scott turned his wheel to the right like he saw him coming. And they hit almost uh, front corner on, on the driver's side of his car. I just remember their car just coming up off the ground. It was a very violent impact. Ryan Pate ran up to Scott's side of the car. I could tell he was really hurt. He wasn't moving. I was just trying to talk to him and tell him the kids were okay. Tina was unconscious. Rescue personnel arrived quickly. They took Jackson and Avery to a hospital in nearby Columbus County. I was in the ambulance just praying over Avery and just pleading with God to restore their family. Rescuers worked to get Scott and Tina out of their car and tended to two injured passengers thrown from the pickup truck. State troopers and sheriff's deputies searched for Gallegos and another passenger who fled into nearby woods. It's very chaotic. We're trying to secure the scene, care for the well-being of the others and uh, find the people who had fled the scene. Troopers ultimately caught and arrested Gallegos. Scott and Tina were taken to New Hanover Regional Medical Center. A relative called Scott's mother and her husband John. His instruction to John was, was to get, come on, come quick. Soon after Scott's mother and stepfather arrived, a doctor delivered the news. He had a severe head trauma. His spine was shattered. Every bone in his face and upper body was broken. A short time later, the doctor told Scott's parents that he couldn't save their son. Oh, and he asked me if I wanted to see him. To say goodbye. And I told him yes. I did. Tina suffered a severe head injury. It just, it just tore me up. The driver who hit her, Ramiro Gallegos, had a blood alcohol content of .22, nearly three times the legal limit. I just thought, my God, that's just so senseless, you know, somebody, you know, to do this. There was more disturbing news. Gallegos was an illegal immigrant with five previous DWI arrests, including four convictions. One involved another head-on collision in Myrtle Beach. When I found that out, my anger left him and started to go towards our government policies and I started to feel very abandoned by our lawmakers and our government. Next, where the fights against drunk driving and illegal immigration intersect and how the Gallegos case reveals failures in both. There was a tragedy, but it was no accident. The crash that killed Scott Gardner and disabled his wife, Tina, raises difficult questions. Why, with his history of DWI arrests, was Romero Gallegos still on the road that day? Why, after being deported twice, was he still in this country? And why do so many Hispanic men, whether here illegally or not, drive drunk? Gallegos was charged with murder in Scott Gardner's death, but the prosecutor and Gardner's family didn't want to risk a trial by jury. They agreed to a plea bargain, and so did Gallegos. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. A judge sentenced him to between 14 and 18 years in prison. It was what we could do and assure that he'd be gone and out of the way and not uh, harming anyone else. But how was Gallega still able to harm the gardeners after being caught so many times before? His first DWI arrest was in Michigan in 2001, the second in Brunswick County in 2002. He was scheduled to come to court. He was never in court. Three weeks later, he was arrested for drunk driving again after crashing into an SUV in North Myrtle Beach. A few months later, Gallegos was arrested a fourth time for DWI in Duplin County. That should have earned him a felony conviction and a minimum one year in prison. But the judge in Duplin County saw no prior DWIs on his record and gave Gallegos just a week in jail and a $250 fine. And I'm sure if they had had some type of way of checking this, or maybe on the first one or the second one, there's no judge here in North Carolina that's going to let this guy go. Gallegos was arrested a fifth time for DWI in Brunswick County in 2004. Again, the court handled the case without knowing his record, including his failure to appear for his first Brunswick County arrest. We're not equipped to share the information that we need in order 
for one county to know what's happening in another county and even more so one state to know what's happening in another state as it relates to issues such as, as DWIs. Antonio Medina! Gore says the situation is complicated by an overwhelmed court system. We've had as many as a thousand driving cases in one day of court here. It's not unusual for us to have 500 uh, to be handled by one prosecutor in a day's, day's time. Gore says if his office had known about Gallegos' record of DWIs and deportations, they could have kept him off the road. Well, we didn't. We found that out after uh, the fact and after it was too late for, for uh, Scott and Tina and, and the Gardner family. I smell alcohol in the vehicle. Who's been drinking? Gore says holding illegal immigrants accountable for their crimes can be a challenge. They may come to court the first time. We may uh, see them that one single time, but we don't see them again. Uh, they pick up, they move, and they're gone. If they're caught, law enforcement officers can't always be sure they've caught the right person. Most of them don't have any kind of identification, and if they do, a lot of times it's uh, these um, these little fake IDs that you can get, you can buy just about anywhere now. That alcohol will certainly a factor in this one. Justice is hard to come by when you can't find offenders or establish their identity. Then you end up having a long string of, of offenses for which they're never held accountable. After any of his arrests, local law enforcement officers could have reported Gallegas to immigration officials. But local authorities usually do that only in felony cases and are only supposed to enforce local and state laws, not federal ones. Besides, immigration officials had already deported Gallegos twice before. My son didn't have to die. The man that drove the truck that took his life had been in front of a judge five times. He had been deported from this country twice. And had our borders been secure and our judicial system not been broken, Scott would be alive and Tina would be caring for her children. I don't have any problem of the immigrants wanting to come here to the United States. I, I have no problem with that. I mean, I know, I know they want a better, you know, a better life, you know, but he was, illegal is illegal, you know, <laughs> that he, he was illegal. It's gone on long enough and something needs to be done. The Gardner case got the attention of North Carolina Representative Sue Myrick an outspoken critic of illegal immigration. You can't even find words to describe the horror of what it did to their family. And ours is not isolated. There's people all over this nation that are living the horror that the Gardner and the Jackson families live with every single day. And it's time to put an end to it. It's a great national security matter. In 2005, Representative Myrick introduced the Scott Gardner Act, as part of a larger immigration bill. Yeah, how many beers have you had? The law would require illegal immigrants convicted of DWI to be deported. That may help change their attitude about drinking and driving, knowing that it's an automatic deportation. But Myrick knows deportation is futile without a secure border. And they deport them and they come right back in. The Scott Gardner Act would also improve information sharing among various law enforcement agencies. Three, four, four, three, three. And it would allow local police and sheriff's departments to join in federal efforts to crack down on illegal immigration. We've all heard the statistics. More than two years after Scott Gardner's death, Myrick is still trying to get the bill that bears his name passed. It's so senseless. And why does it take so long to get something done? That's my frustration. Next, some of the reasons behind the high rate of drunk driving among Hispanic immigrants. There's an awful lot of young Latino men here by themselves nothing for them to do uh, except for drinking. Hispanic immigrants grew up in places very different than North Carolina. That doesn't excuse drunk driving, but it may help explain why so many drive drunk and help provide clues as to how to solve the problem. On that hot July afternoon in 2005, the Highway Patrol says Ramiro Gallegos and a friend stopped at this Mexican store on Highway 130 in Brunswick County to get more beer. Gallegos had been drinking all day. I just remember thinking, this is a nightmare. You know, who's drunk at 5 o'clock in the afternoon while we're trying to get on a family vacation? We need to educate folks that you know, this is just not an acceptable um, practice in the United States and it won't be tolerated. 
A recent study out of the University of North Carolina Highway Research Center shows that Hispanic drivers involved in crashes were two and a half times more likely to be drunk than white drivers and three times more likely to be drunk than black drivers. Hispanics also account for about 18 percent of all drunk driving arrests in our state, but less than 7 percent of the state's population. Drunk driving is also the number one cause of death among Hispanic men in our state. Obviously, the, the numbers speak for themselves. We have uh, overrepresentation in DWIs, uh, so I'm not going to say it, it's not happening. Um, the question is, what are we going to do about it? The answer may come from looking first at why it's happening. Experts point to cultural differences. Many Hispanic immigrants don't speak or read English. Many didn't grow up driving their own cars, getting driver safety education, or living in communities with tough drunk driving laws and penalties. I think a lot of what we're seeing is just because you know, they're, they're not familiar with the rules, they're not familiar with the laws, they're, they're just acting the way they've always acted in terms of what was culturally acceptable. This is my office. Greenville attorney Mario Perez says most of his clients are illegal immigrants with traffic citations, including DWI. He says many of them come from places where the consequences are far less severe. You pay some money to the judge or to a court or some officer or even in that case, and, and that resolves the case. Whereas here, when you explain the process to them, uh, they really sometimes have a tough time understanding that. We don't want you drunk. We don't want you drunk. Experts say there is also a certain machismo surrounding drinking and driving among Hispanic men. The machismo part is what says even if I'm falling drunk, I cannot admit that I'm falling drunk because that would be kind of like a losing face type deal. ACN says that same machismo might prevent that driver from turning over his keys to a sober driver. No, gracias. Tengo que manejar. Mejor dame una soda, por favor. El Pueblo has a multimedia educational campaign targeting the Hispanic community. We want to make sure that... Uh, we lower the number of DWI among Latinos. The campaign focuses on the consequences of drinking and driving, not only on individuals, but on their families and communities. So we're trying to educate the folks that it's not just you. You know, when you drink and you drive, it's not just you. You're hurting all Latinos. Spanish language newspapers in our state are publishing the names of Hispanic people arrested for DWI. And we want people to see, hey, look, these are the people getting arrested because that public shame is bad for machismo too, so we're using that in our in our favor. Now serving A zero. Some advocates say when it comes to illegal immigrants, allowing them to get a driver's license would make sure they get driver safety education and would give them an incentive to obey the law. If you don't have a license, and many and many times you can't get insurance, you can't get your vehicle titled. Perez says his undocumented clients who have licenses will do anything to keep them. And I always believe those people were more apt to do what they needed to do. They were more responsible. Uh, they went to court. He's got to match. He's got to match. But North Carolina has made it tougher for illegal immigrants to get licenses, requiring more documentation to get a license and using facial recognition technology to check identity. But it doesn't stop them from driving. That's going to be bad because people are going to start driving without a driver's license. I'm seeing people charged with an operator's license with the insurance not being right, for the title not being, the car not being registered. So you're seeing a lot of that. Next, another reminder of the potential consequences when anyone drives drunk. And my world as I knew it is totally different now. And I didn't choose for it to be different. But I'm forced to live with it. To learn more about the issues covered in this episode of Focal Point, visit WRAL.com, click on News, and then Documentaries. Drunk drivers come in many colors, white, black, Hispanic, or any other race. Victims come in many colors, too. So when there is an unusually high rate of drunk driving among one group of people, it's worth examining the reasons why, to help keep our roads safer and to prevent the kind of tragedy that tore Scott Gardner's family apart. On July 16, 2006, exactly one year after the wreck, family members, rescue workers, law enforcement officers and others gathered at the scene for a memorial service. During the service, officers directing traffic stopped a drunk driver. It was a lady could hardly stand up, had already run two or three people off the road the same day, a year to the day. It was a sobering reminder of the tragedy. 
A memorial erected at the scene is a reminder of its human cost. There is an online reminder too. A website called the Gardner Family Circle that advocates for change. And it is also a wonderful way to keep Scott's memory uh, alive. Scott and Tina's children are living reminders of what happened. They're now being raised by Tina's parents. We can't do as good a job as Scott and Tina would have done, uh, uh, but we're going to do the very best that we can. And then there's Tina, alive but in a nursing home, unable to walk or speak. I still have Tina, but I don't, it's, it's not the Tina that I used to have. I've got a new Tina. And it, it's, it's just hard. Just. It, it, it's hard to go up there and see Tina because Tina was such a good, good child. Life as we expected it was taken away. You know, John and I thought that we were at a point in our life where we were going to watch our children raise their children. And that was all changed in the flash of a moment. Our tomorrow was removed.